Hi and welcome to Physics High and today I'm going to be addressing module 7 type questions from the HSC exams from 2011 to 2014. Now just the one small caveat, a reminder, is that these are based on the old syllabus and so therefore the, the questions that I can extract from those that are relevant are generally to do with the photoelectric effect, so quantum aspects of light and also the concept of special relativity. But so uh, hopefully this will still be very helpful for you as you practice HSC style questions. Now like all of the videos that I produce on HSC style questions, you're going to get maximum benefit by actually attempting the questions. So my suggestion is go to my website or in the link in the description below, I'll provide an actual uh, question list where you can do the questions or simply pause the video before you listen to my answers. But before we move on, please consider supporting me buy me a coffee, the link is in the description below and help support the work that I do. Let's get started. So question number 17 talks about photons with a certain energy E, strikes a metal surface and electrons may be emitted. The maximum kinetic energy is given by that formula where W is the constant for the metal or it's called the work function. Which of the following graphs shows the relationship between the maximum kinetic energy of these electrons and the wave of those photons? Now to establish a mathematical relationship with graphs, it's always helpful to actually write down the formula that we're interested in. So the kinetic energy of my photons is equal to our energy, which is going to be our HF minus phi, which is our work function. That's what I usually prefer to write. Phi or W is okay too but we're given the wavelength. But what is the wavelength? Well, if we invoke the wave equation of C equals F lambda, then what we get is our K now becomes equal to HC over lambda minus phi. Now, what does this mean? That means if you look at forgetting the constant and dropping over here, we know that K is proportional to HC over lambda. That means it's an inverse relationship between K and lambda. And that's what we're looking for, an inverse relationship. And the only graph that represents an inverse relationship is B. A, C are both linear relationships. The only difference is, is where our constant is in terms of our work function. So the bottom one here is the correct graph if this was frequency, but it's not, it's wavelength. And D is definitely not correct. Next question. This is a short answer type question with five marks. It says calculate the number of photons for with a wavelength of 450 nanometers which are required to transfer that amount of energy. Well this is a two-step process and we'll look at it in a moment. And then part B says a one watt beam of light transfers one joule per second from point to another. In essence that basically means a watt is one joule per second. That's the definition of it. With reference to a particle model of light, contrast a one watt beam of red light and a one watt beam of blue light. Contrast meaning what are the differences? Let's have a first of all look at our energy. We know that our E is equal to HF and as we've said in the previous question that is equal to HC over lambda. So using our lambda, we can automatically tell straight away that if we have one single photon, then the value is 6.626 by 10 to the power of negative 34. That's Planck's constant. We multiply that by the speed of light, which is 10 to the power of eight. And then our wavelength ends up being 450 times 10 to the power of negative nine. That gives me a value of 4.42 by 10 to the power of negative 19 joules. That's the amount for one photon. But we're given one by 10 to the negative three joules of energy. So automatically our number of photons is going to be simply equal to the value of energy that we're given, which is one by 10 to the power of negative three. And then of course that's divided by, by 4.42 by 10 to the power of negative 19, which is the energy per photon. And if we calculate that out, we're going to get 2.64 by 10 to the power of 15. Of course, that has to be a whole number, but of course we're rounding out the number to three significant digits. For part B, a watt of blue light and a watt of red light. 
and what is the difference between the two? Well, we've got one watt, which is one joule per second. So that is the total energy, which of course is related to the number of photons that you're going to get. And of course, what's the energy of each of those photons? Now, we don't know the actual wavelength that we're dealing with, but the point here is, is that red and blue, remember we've got to refer to the quantum nature of light, is that red light has a lower energy value per photon because the frequency is lower. And so therefore, because of E is equal to HF. An individual red photon of light has a lower energy value than an individual blue photon. Now, in terms of, we're talking about one watt beam, so we're getting a total amount of joules per second. So what that, does that mean? If they're equivalent in terms of one watt, in other words, we get one joule per second, what does that tell you? Well, if we're getting equivalent one joule per second, that basically means you're going to get a lot more photons of light of the red than the blue. So you need many, you've got lots of red photons, but fewer blue. Why? Because individually they have a small, the red ones have a small amount of energy. So therefore to make up one joule per second, you need a lot more photons to do that. Question number two, this is case, we've jumped to the 2012 paper here. What is currently used to define the standard meter? This is just a simply recall question and it relates to the whole idea of our precision of our instruments for one thing. And ultimately our definition of a meter is simply the distance light travels in one over 299-792-458 meters per second, which is in essence, it's based on the speed of light. So the speed of light is used to define the standard meter. Now, I won't go into the full details here. I do have a video that specifically discusses the implications that are addressed here. And I suggest you have a look at that video and I'll put the link above. Question 28, short response question again. Now we're jumping to Einstein's theory of relativity or special theory of relativity to be more precise. It says outline one piece of evidence supporting it what criteria are used to test and validate theories, and then finally, what the distance between the cathode ray and screen are, is this mount? If an electron travels through that space, what the apparent distance from the cathode to the screen of the electron's frame of reference? So that's, what's this all about? Well, first of all, when we've got one piece of evidence supporting Einstein's theory of relativity, there's a whole bunch of ones that you could mention. So in the evidence we're dealing here, in terms of the HSC syllabus, we're looking at special theory of re relativity. Again, I'm not going to go outline a huge number of examples. Check out my videos where I specifically talk for the evidence specifically of time dilation as one of the examples. But if we're going to look at time dilation, I'll just write TD. You have got a couple. You've got the muon, that is the existence of subatomic particles that are created in the upper atmosphere. Their half-lives are dilated when we measure them. Then, of course, there's, there's the famous Hafeel-Keating experiment where we have atomic clocks on a plane compared to a clock kept on the ground, and there is a time difference. Now, it's more than just special relativity. Also, a general relativity plays, plays a part as well, but that's the one that we mentioned. And the third one I want to mention is the whole idea of momentum dilation, or P uh, dilation, and that is the idea that particle accelerators, such as the one at CERN, the Large Hadron Collider, the momentum of particles traveling at close to the speed of light is significantly larger uh, than, let's say, using the classical methodology. So there's a lot of you can mention, and I've outlined a couple, and all you need to do is mention one. B, what criteria are used to test and validate theory? So let's break that down. How do you test a theory? Well, you design experiments, and those experiments are consistent with the theory or the model that you have. So your evidence must support theory in terms of to test it. But what about validation? Well, validation says, well, if a theory or a, a model, or to be more precise, has any predictive value, then you can make predictions. And then if you can run experiments that test those predictions, that automatically means you validate the model as well. So that's the key. Do your experimental evidence support the model? Do the predictions that are an outcome of that model, do they 
have experiments that validate those predictions. And final question says, the distance between this cathode, of course, is 40 centimeters, and the electron travels through that at three by 10 to the power of seven. What's the apparent distance? Now, this, in essence, is a length contraction situation, which, of course, is based on this formula. The length, or the contracted length, is equal to L naught, multiplied by the square root of one minus V squared over C squared. Now, it's important to distinguish which is which. We are measuring three by 10 to the power of seven. We are in the frame of reference of our tube. The electron is in a separate frame of reference. It's moving within that tube. And so therefore the length that is contracted is the electrons so-called experience of that length. So that means what we end up getting is 0.4, which of course is the distance, the proper distance multiplied by the square root of one minus. Now this speed is 10% of the speed of light. So I'm just going to put 0.1 in here and square it so that the C squares cancel. And if you calculate that out, you're going to get 0.398 meters. Question eight, we have here four diagrams and we're asked for which is an example of an inertial frame of reference. What's an inertial frame of reference? It's a frame of reference that is moving at a constant velocity. And as a result, if you are in an inertial frame of reference, you cannot detect you're moving because all the laws of physics remain invariant. They don't change. So what we really want is basically no acceleration. Well, A is a situation where the velocity is such that it's turning, which means we have an acceleration, centripetal acceleration. So that's out. B, we have an acceleration in the downwards, so that's out. C, we have an acceleration across the page, that's out. The only possible answer is D, where the velocity is constant, it's inertial frame of reference, and that's in. Question number 19, a spaceship moves close to the speed of light relative to the planet. A rest frame length of the spaceship can be determined by an observer who is. Okay, so here's the key. How do you know what the rest frame length of the spaceship is? Well, if you need to measure the length, the rest frame length of the spacecraft, you need to be in the same frame of reference. In other words, you need to be stationary relative to the spacecraft. Can the spacecraft be moving? Yes, it can be at a constant velocity, but you need to be moving with the same constant velocity with it. So it has to be in the same initial frame of reference. And so with that in mind, let's go through it. You can be on the spaceship and measure the time taken for the light travel between two points on the planet. Hold on, you're now looking outside your frame of reference. So A is incorrect. B, you're on the planet measuring the time for light to travel from the front to the back of the spacecraft. Well, again, you are now outside the frame of reference, so B is incorrect. You're on the spaceship, measuring the time of flight for travel from the front to the back of the spaceship. Aha, you're doing an experiment on the actual spaceship, so that is correct. Let's have a look at D. You're on the planet. Hold on, now you are not in the same frame of reference as the rocket, so again, that's incorrect. So C is the correct answer. Question number 20. Back to the photoelectric effect again. We've got the graph shows the maximum kinetic energy E for with photoelectrons emitted as a function of frequency of two different metals. The metals are illuminated with light for a wavelength of 450 nanometers. What is the effect of doubling the intensity without changing the wavelength? Well, the key here is to know, well, if we've got a wavelength of 450 nanometers, what's its equivalent frequency? Well, to do that, of course, you just go C divided by lambda. So the value we're going to get is 6.67 by 10 to the power of 14 hertz. Okay, what that, does that mean? If we apply that to our graph, we're going to basically get a light that is being shone at a value that is roughly in this position. Now, what does that mean? Well, that basically means that for X, because the frequency is high enough, since this represents the work function, where the work function equals HF0, that means we're going to get some electrons liberated from material X because we are at a higher frequency than the minimum required to release those photoelectrons. But that's not for Y. You haven't reached the minimum requirement, and so therefore we're going to get no photoelectrons being emitted from Y. Now, of course, 
doubling the intensity has no bearing whatsoever. It just increases the number of photons, but it's about the energy per photon that matters, E equals HF. So with that in mind, let's have a look. For metal X, the number of photoelectrons emitted would not change. No, well, the number of photons would change because we're dealing that the intensity increases the number of photons, and so therefore we would have emission, but the maximum kinetic energy would increase. Hold on, no, no, the kinetic energy remains constant, so that's incorrect. Metal X, the number of photons emitted would increase. Well, that's fine. Increasing the intensity will increase the number of photons, but the maximum kinetic energy would remain unchanged. That is true, so well, let's circle it. But let's have a look at C and D. For both metals X and Y, the number of photoelectrons emitted would not change. But hold on, nothing's being emitted from Y at all, and so the intensity is not going to change, so therefore that's incorrect. And for D, both metals X and Y, the number of photoelectrons would increase. Aha, uh -huh. again, that's not correct either. So the only possible answer is B. Question number 14 from 2014 now. Why is the a low intensity of black body radiation at very short wavelengths? Okay, so what we're getting over here is our black body curve, which looks something like this. What we're really saying is, why are we getting a low number of intensity over here? Now, the intensity, amount of energy you're getting per wavelength, is simply about the number of photons that you are getting. And so, therefore, this simply says that I'm not getting many photons over here, I'm getting a lot more photons over here, and of course, a lower number of large wavelength photons over here. So, a, the energy of each photon is reduced at very short wavelengths. We know that to be incorrect because the energy, of course, is related to E equals HF. And so therefore, at short wavelengths, we have high frequency, which means high energy. So A is incorrect. There are fewer photons with high energy at very short wavelengths. Well, that's true. We've just established that. Only photons of very short wavelengths are reabsorbed by a black body. No, that's not correct. In fact, all of them can be reabsorbed, so therefore, they not C. And photons of very short wavelengths interact with each other, causing destructive interference. Well, that is totally incorrect. So the answer is B. Number 19. The rest length of a train is 200 meters, and the rest length of a railway platform is 160 meters. The train rushes past the platform so fast that an observer in the platform's frame of reference, the train and the platform are the same length. So what's going on? The train is appearing length contracted. Now, in reality, this is not exactly how length contraction works. You can't see both the front and the back of the train at the same time. In essence, you're making two independent measurements of the train. But we'll go with the question because ultimately it's about length contraction. And really, that's what it means. It means that the train has reduced to a distance of 160 meters so that it actually fits the platform. So what you end up getting is that the length contracted of the train is the proper length of the train multiplied by the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. Now we know that what we want is this particular value over here. So substituting our values in, we have 160 is equal to 200 multiplied by the square root of 1 minus. Now, because we're working out in terms of C, we might as well just say x squared over here, knowing that x is going to be some decimal less than 1. Now, to work this out, you basically divide both sides by 200, so you end up getting 80 over 10, or simply equal to 0.8 on this side is equal to the square root of 1 minus x squared. We square both sides, so we get 0.64 is equal to 1 minus x squared. That means our x squared is going to equal to 1 minus 0.64, which of course is equal to 0.36, and that means my x is going to be equal to 0.6. Looking at our responses, a is my correct answer. Well, I hope that has helped you some of the module seven type questions from the papers from 2011 to 2014. Now, admittedly, mainly to deal with relativity and the quantum nature of light, and that's just the nature of the old HSC style of questions. But hopefully it's been helpful for you. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. Buy me a coffee to support the work that I do. My name is Paul from Physics. Hi, take care, and bye for now.